And there's a few things about this story that are, are, are really fascinating. You know, first of all, um, you know, Jesus, you know, sends these disciples out. If you know the story, I, I just read it, but just to quickly paraphrase, he's talking to the crowds. He says, hey, you guys immediately need to take off. He, he sends the crowds away. Jesus ascends up to this mountain, finds himself alone. The disciples are out in the water. They're being buffeted by the waves and by the wind. They're not making a lot of headway. They're not getting closer to the shore. And all of a sudden, Jesus decides at 3 a.m. in the morning to just start walking on the water. A couple things to note. There's no context for walking on water. In case you were wondering, like the disciples had never had an official walking on water training class. Like you just didn't know that. It wasn't talked about. We have no recorded evidence in scripture that they ever shared this concept of what was possible about walking on water. It was absolutely impossible, unheard of, and unknown. It's not like some form, you know, famous evangelist at that time had just released Walking on Water 101. Or how to walk on water in a daily life or, you know, the water walking purpose driven life. Like no one had ever come up with a book at this time where you would suddenly open it and you'd be like, oh, like walking on water. It's legit. I can do this. You know, there's no context. Okay, so the fact that the disciples had no context is one thing we need to know. The other thing that we need to note is, of course, Jesus starts walking on the water, which is legit. I don't know why he didn't fly. If I was Jesus, I would fly. I would always prefer to fly. But he just decides to walk on the water. As he's walking on the water, the disciples see this form of Jesus they don't recognize. They're scared of this, this, this picture of Jesus. They think it's a ghost. They, they don't even know what this is. It could be a spirit. It could be a ghost. It could be someone back from the dead. Who knows where their mind's going with this? And it says that they're afraid. They actually scream out, it's a ghost. And Jesus says, it's all good. It's I. Don't worry about it. And then Peter says, as we read, Jesus, if it's you, tell me to come on the water. So here's my second issue with this whole, this whole story here. It, it, it would appear at first glance that Peter is issuing the statement, Lord, if it is you, bid me to come on the water, because he's looking for a specific response from Jesus that would validate or verify that this thing on the water is Jesus. Right. You following me? That it's, it's very similar to what I would consider maybe like a security question for some online account. For those of you who have ever been on the internet, hands, three of you. There's this thing called this internet, www, it's the World Wide Web. And like when you create an online account or a banking account, if you're going to purchase something online, you often have to create security questions. How many know what I'm talking about? Yeah. You know, and it usually asks you, um, you know, what was your dog's name? If you were me and you had 60 animals growing up, like you wouldn't know that. It's very similar if they asked, what was your address growing up? I do not know. They lived in 100 houses. Okay, my parents were crazy missionaries. Or they'll, they'll ask you questions like, you know, what was your mother's maiden name? You know what I'm talking about? What's your social security number? These would be questions that would be uniquely only known to you that would validate and verify that you are the person that you say you are when you're doing this online or over the phone transaction. If those of you who don't know what a security question is and you've never done this before, you've either never been on the internet or you're about to be a victim of identity theft. <laughs> so it would appear as if Peter is making this statement. Are you following with me? Because I'm just being, I'm being the practical guy. Rereading the scriptures, not just, you know, going with the flannel graph that I grew up with. I'm being the practical guy saying, how do you get out on the water at 3 a.m. in the morning when there's no frame of reference, when you've never read it in a book before, when Jesus has never talked about it that we know of, and how does your instant response naturally become, hey, if it's you, tell me to come. And if I'm going to get out of a boat in the midst of a storm that I'm making no progress in and I'm afraid of the thing that's approaching me and talking to me, I want to know that this thing is actually Jesus. Anyone agree? Like, I want to make sure that I'm not getting out in the boat with some weird spirit, some crazy crook, some thing I don't know. Like, I need to know that this is Jesus, and I need you to tell me some tangible evidence that would validate that this thing is you. And what does Peter give him? The craziest security question in history. If it's you, tell me to come. <laughs> if it's a spirit, he's like, this guy's an idiot. <laughs> come. It's like the bank calling you, like, hey, this is Bank of America. We need your, you know, social security number. Well, just tell me my name's Jedediah. Oh, Jedediah. Oh, here you go. Like, <laughs> it doesn't add up, correct? And, and not only does it not add up, but, like, why didn't Peter tell Jesus just to come into the boat? This is just me. I'm sorry. Logical guy. Like, hey, the storm's crazy. This is the form of you I don't recognize. Instead of, hey, Jesus, if that's you, tell me to come. I'd be like, hey, Jesus, if that's you, just come in the boat. <laughs> just get in the boat with us. It's like really simple. Get in the boat. But like somehow this crazy thing in Peter says, if it's you, tell me to come. 
You know, and, as I, and I look at all of these different issues, and I'm like, why is this scripture even here? Why is Jesus walking and not flying? Okay, how is Peter's first response to say walk on the water? And how is Peter not giving a better qualifying question to validate that this thing is even Jesus? Anybody with me now on my mental issues I have with the Bible? And as I begin, as I begin to study this, a few things come alive in my spirit, and I realize that Peter's not as stupid as I think he is. There's times he's really stupid, just you know, no offense, but like, that's the good news is that we can be just like the disciples and miss it and mess up and blow it, and Jesus still says, follow me. But there's, there's one thing I realize is that, is that Peter started following Jesus a few years before this moment. Most scholars, most biblical historians believe that this account, this walk in the water account, happened about two years, two and a half years after he called the first disciples. The first disciples being called was Peter, who was Simon at the time, and his brother Andrew. And one thing I realized is that after a few years of walking with somebody, after a few years of following somebody, after a few years of spending all of your time with somebody, it would just be natural for you to recognize that person's voice. It would just be natural for you to understand who was talking to you, who was calling you. You know, the one thing I realized is that I have this incredible, amazing two-year-old, beautiful daughter. Thank God she looks like her mom, um, named Anaya. And the one thing that was such a joy for me in the season of travel was that I could call her at six months years old. It's not years old. I, I don't know why I always say that. Six months old. Every new father says six months years old. It's six months old. There's no years in months, okay? Six months old, and I, and I could call my wife, and I could be in Nicaragua, I could be in Honduras, I could be Africa, I could be anywhere, and this little human, this little beautiful creature who, who can't talk yet, and she's talking gibberish. She didn't even have teeth at this point. Think if she tried to talk, it would have sounded really weird because she had no teeth. She, she couldn't talk yet. She couldn't walk yet. She couldn't crawl yet. She's six months old. She couldn't tell you what the color red was or blue was. She couldn't, like, do two plus two. She couldn't even stand on her own. But this little six-month creature, this little six-month-old creation, when her daddy could call from no matter where he was in the world, she didn't need to see my face to know that it was her daddy. She didn't need to have me walk into the room to recognize her daddy. All she needed was to hear my voice and she would know that that was her father on the phone. And she would actually respond to that voice. I would call Amber, and she would put her on speaker, and I'd just start going crazy like dads do. And I'm, like, sitting there being like, I hope she's really putting the phone next to Anaya, and this is not, like, just a gag. And I'm like, ooh, look, 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 And she's like, ah, it's full. Anaya's not even here. She's sleeping, you know. <laughs> and, and. And she, and, and she would sit there and she goes, I go, what is she doing? She's like, she's laughing, she's giggling, she's jumping, she's squirming, she's, you know, she's trying to move her neck. She can't even hold her head up. You know, like, she was just excited to hear her father's voice. And after six months, guess what? She knew my voice. You could have put anyone else on the phone and they could have said, Anaya, this is your dad. And she would not have responded the same way. That she knew the very vibrations. She knew the very definitions. She knew the attributes that uniquely made my voice my voice, and she would respond to my voice. What's crazy now is that at two years old, she obviously knows my voice even more. And not only does she know my voice, but she trusts my voice. That, that when she cries in the middle of the night, I could walk into a pitch black room and just start saying her name before I even get to her, before I even touch her, before I even pick her up. And guess what? She automatically starts calming down. She hasn't seen me yet. But she knows by the sound of my voice that I'm there. And not only that, she knows that because she can hear my voice, she's safe now. She can trust me now. She's okay now. It's going to be okay. You want to know why? Because her dad's in the room. He hasn't picked me up. He hasn't given me my binky. He hasn't put a bottle in my mouth. I just know by the sound of his voice and the nature of the character that he carries that I'm safe. And as I look at this story from that perspective, I realize that Peter is not looking for a specific response to Jesus when he poses the statement, if it's you, bid me to come on the water. He's not looking for a specific response. He's listening for a specific voice. He's listening to make sure that this thing that he doesn't recognize in the midst of a crazy storm is the person he's been following for two years. He's listening to hear the sounds and the vibrations and the inflections in this simple response, which would say to him, it's okay. I'm safe. 
I can trust this thing out on the water. I can get out on the boat because I know his voice. And what's even more fascinating to me is that the first word, you might not know this, that Peter ever heard, heard proceed from the mouth of Jesus was when he first called him to follow him. And the first word that Jesus ever said to Peter, who was Simon and his brother Andrew, was the word, come. So Peter is in the midst of the storm. He sees this form of Jesus he doesn't recognize. He has no frame of reference for walking on water. He hasn't been trained in it. He's not affluent in it. He can't find it in scripture. But all he knows is the sound of a voice that he's been following for two years. And he started following that voice when it first said the word, come. And we need to know because I think this, I think this whole story is in scripture so that it could relate to where we're at in our lives. Because so many of us are like, well, the disciples had it easy. They could see Jesus. The disciples had it, had it figured out. Like it was simple to follow somebody who you could see, right? Anyone think that? Like Jesus, if you would just show up and I could just see your flowing hair and your beautiful man beard. And like I could just, I could just see you. Like it would make everything easier. Has anyone ever thought that? Like if I could just see your face, like it would make sense. But do you realize that when Jesus first called the disciples he was a nobody when Jesus first called Peter and Andrew he had done nothing he was being followed by no one Jesus was not popular Jesus had no Twitter followers Jesus didn't even have a Facebook account okay there's no Facebook back then don't look at me so seriously so when Jesus called them what were they following When Jesus said, come and follow me, I'm going to make you fishers of men. He didn't have a resume. He didn't have a following. He didn't have a church. He didn't have, you know, books written out. He didn't have CD sets he could give them. He didn't have a website. He didn't have any recognition. He was a nobody that had done nothing in ministry. But when they followed him, they followed his voice. Because something inside the voice of Jesus, something about our Father's voice causes us to come alive, awakens purpose, awakens destiny, awakens desire, awakens focus. When, when you hear the voice of Jesus, it actually bids you to do something that makes no sense. That when they heard Jesus' voice for the first time, they logically, as businessmen in a successful fishing career, said, you know what, I'm leaving my nets. I'm leaving my boat. I'm leaving my friends. I'm forsaking my family. I'm laying it all down. Not because I I have evidence, not because there's a history of what he's going to do, not because he's got a following, not because it's popular, not because it's cool, not because it's comfortable, not because it's easy, because something in his voice comes alive inside of me like no other voice that I've ever heard before, so I got to follow it. Do you not think six months in into this crazy journey of following Jesus that Peter and his brother maybe thought back on that first moment Jesus called them. I just know that, man, Jesus has been calling me and my wife to do some crazy things. And, like, I look back and reflect on the moments he said, do this, leave this, go here. And you look back and you go, man, that, that one voice, that one leading changed everything. Do you not think that for six months in or a year in or now two years in that Peter hadn't reflected on the first word he ever heard proceed from the mouth of Jesus, the Messiah, he knew this word come. And he knew the sound of his voice. So when he said, if it's you, tell me to come, he was saying, I just need to hear your voice. I I'm just going to follow your voice. I've, I've gotten two years into this crazy thing called a disciple and following Jesus because of your voice. I've seen eyes open because of your voice. I've seen dead raised because of your voice. I've seen bread broken and fish multiplied because of your voice. I've seen critics quieted because of your voice and demons tremble and flee because of your voice. The one constant, the one consistent, the one thing I can bet on and guarantee is your voice. You know, we're, we're here today just to make this real. We're here in a church today because our pastors heard someone's voice. Do you realize that? We're here today because one day God said, go start a church in the desert. You might be here today because a friend of yours said, it's time to go. Or they've been asking you for a while. And that voice said, all right, I'm going to go. 
that we've been led to these moments in history that have changed and shaped our life forever because people have been following his voice. In the stories in the Bible to say we don't need to see where he's taking us. We don't need to know exactly how it's going to happen. We don't need to know the plan. We don't need to have the five steps and the Roman numerals. Those people drive me crazy, but if it's you, I love you. You know, we don't need to know every specific step. We don't need it written out on screen. We don't need a, an audible voice from heaven saying this is what you're supposed to do. All we're doing is leading in to listen for the first thing we heard the first time when we decided to serve him. All we're doing is leaning in so we can hear him just say the one thing that we need him to say so we can say, I can get out of this boat. It don't matter to me. I can walk through the storm. It doesn't matter to me. I can pursue this relationship. I can take this job. I can sell this business. I can go on a missions field. I can go to my neighbor. I can love my boss. I can do all of these things because all I'm following is the voice. 